Dr. Easley knows how to help his customers have a good time. That's why he knows exactly what to open up, an alligator-themed theme park. And so one of the, the problems that he's trying to work with right now is that he's got this giant alligator that's one of the attractions there, and uh, he needs to know how much force is going to be carried in a hydraulic ram that actually actuates these giant mechanical jaws so that the people at his park can uh, really be impressed by the action of those jaws. And uh, so that's what we're gonna help him with is to find the force in that, uh, in that ram. So uh, what we need to do is actually, first of all, start looking at this system. I know there's a lot going on here and it can be a little bit intimidating, um, but one of the things that we are going to need to do is draw a free body diagram of a couple of different parts one is the upper jaw and one is the lower jaw and one thing that actually helps out a lot in these you don't always have to draw your free body diagrams with all the level of detail and complexity that looks like the picture is it's okay as long as you get all of the points of interest in the correct location relative to the other ones it's okay for you to simplify it a little bit and so that's what i'm going to do here with this problem is i'm going to actually show uh, for instance, the little segment between A and B, I'll show that as part of the jaw. And then there's another segment that goes from A up to E, something like this. Okay, and this is going to be rep my representation of the upper jaw. This is actually, well, I'm not quite done there because the other thing that I need is this length that sticks down uh, R1. So this is this much that I show right here is the, my representation of the upper jaw. And we understand that it's kind of this rigid body uh, that all holds together, and it gives me all of the points of interest for that body. Okay, um, so what I need to start doing now is putting on this body all of my different forces that might exist. There's a pin that exists at B that can that keeps this body from moving left or right or up or down. So I'm going to put on here R. BX and up here RBY to indicate that that pin can't move. Uh, the next thing I'll do is show the weight. Okay, weight acts straight down at the center of gravity, and that upper jaw, it says up here, weighs 670 pounds. Okay, so far so good. So the next thing to deal with is this hydraulic ram. And this probably should be discussed just a little bit. Um, with that ram in there like that, a ram is a member that is connected only at two points with frictionless pins. That meets the criteria for the type of member that we would call something like a link or a two-force member. And it means that the line of action that exists in that member exists along a line that extends from one pin to the other. Okay, and if we look at that, uh, we can assume a couple things. We can sort of imagine the force acting in that body a couple of different ways. One is it could try to make the body longer, and one is it could try to make the body shorter. This being a little representation of the ram right here. Uh, if it tries to make the body longer like this, then we say that that uh, ram is in tension. If those forces were both reversed and went the other way, we would say that the ram was in compression. So this here, this is a tension assumption. Um, and this is what I'm going to use for this particular problem. So where the ram interfaces with this body is at point A. Okay, this is B, this is point A. Up here, this is point E. Okay, where this ram interfaces with this body is going to be equal and opposite to how I show it up here. So since I show it up and to the right, then right here, this is going to be down and to the left. Okay, and I'll go ahead and give the name there just F RAM. And I'm making a, an assumption uh, that this is intention by showing that in that way. Okay, uh, the next one that I'd like to do is where these gears interact with each other. We know the radius values of the gear, and so I can show that contact force in between those two gears as one of the forces on here. So I'm going to call that just F contact. 
Okay, so far so good. Uh, let me go ahead and stick some axes on here. Say that this is the x-axis and this is the y-axis. Okay, uh, the next thing that I would like to do is actually put on some dimensions. Okay, so uh, one of the dimensions is over to point E. And what you'll notice there actually is that, you know, that's a dimension of B. It is given in feet rather than inches, whereas a lot of these other ones are given in inches. Um, I think it'll actually help me out to kind of convert a lot of these right up front into inches, the ones that are in feet. So I'm going to take 6.9. Uh, there's 12 inches in a foot, so I'm going to multiply that by 12, and that gives me 82.8 inches for that factor of B. Okay, and while I'm here, I may as well do that for all of these. 3.9 times 12, okay, that gives me 46.8 inches. Uh, D. 5.9 times 12, and that gives me 70.8 inches. And finally, H, which is 6.4. 6.4 times 12 gives me 76.8 inches. And that takes care of converting each of those values into a number that's in inches, which will make it easier for me to deal with in my free body diagram and on my equations. So first of all, we've got 82.8 inches over here. Okay. And I don't actually need to know the height of point E in the Y direction above point B because the line of action of uh, the 670 pound weight is vertical. And so the 82.8 gives me my entire uh, moment arm for that particular force. Okay, the next one that I'd like to do is uh, the distance below this axis right here. This is the value of R1 given in the figure, and R1 was already given in inches, which in, and it's right there at 42 inches. Okay, and then the other thing that's going to matter to me is the horizontal length from A to B, which is uh, basically this right here. I guess I'll show it right here. Okay. That is a dimension of A, and A is 21 inches. Okay. And I'm almost done with this free body diagram, but the next thing, the, the last thing I need to do on it is to actually try to make some expression that gives me the direction of the force in the ram. Since I know that the line of action exists along a line between these pins, I have enough information to actually come up with, um, you know, how far that is, or, or excuse me, the, the slope that that is. And so uh, what we have there is a height between point C and point A of H, and H is 76.8. Okay, for that rise of 76.8, there's a run of, and you'll notice there it's a difference between the dimension C and the dimension A. So we have C being 46.8 inches, whereas A is 21 inches. So 46.8 minus 21 gives me 25.8. So I'm going to put that in down here as uh, 25.8. Okay, and there's my free body diagram. And uh, if you look at this, uh, we, we have too many unknowns on this free body diagram to be able to solve it because this is a non-concurrent force system. We have up to three equations and I have four things that I don't know. F ram, RBY, RBX, and F contact. Uh, so let me go ahead and uh, recognize that I need to draw another free body diagram, this time of the lower jaw. Okay, so here I'm going to show this lower jaw in a similar way, kind of simplified, something like this, where it has a little uh, length that comes up in that way. 
So where I had the F contact before on the old diagram, I'm going to have to draw it equal in magnitude, opposite in direction. So that's F contact. Okay. I also have at point D. Okay, that's this is point D right here. I have a uh, reaction, couple of reaction forces. So um, it's not allowed to move up and down. It's not allowed to move left and right. So I'll call this uh, R D X. I'll call this R D Y. Okay. Um, I do have another force, F ram, that kind of sticks up like this. Okay. And I do know that the slope of F ram is the same here as it was over there. So a run of 25.8 and a rise of 76.8. Okay, and then I need to take care of the uh, weight that happens here. That's given right here of uh, 450 pounds. Okay, and let me go ahead and stick a, I think I kind of can let the earlier y-axis imply the y-axis there, but I'll say this is the x-axis. What else do I need to do? Uh, I probably need to have a couple of more dimensions on here. So I would want to have that this is uh, two and a half inches. Okay, that's, excuse me, not two and a half, 25 inches. Okay, 25 inches uh, is that radius two, R2. Okay. Um, and then I will want to know how far is it uh, from point C to point D horizontally. Okay, and that is just going to be dimension C. Dimension C is 46.8. Okay. And then, of course, I would like to draw on my diagram how far it is from the, for, the line of action of the 450 pound force to the uh, point that it's rotating about there at D. And that's going to be this dimension of D. D is 5.9 feet or 70.8 inches. Okay, and I know this is getting kind of crowded in here, but I'm trying to keep it all on the screen so we can see all of it. These are my two free body diagrams that I need to be able to solve this problem. And what you can see that we can do is for the first free body diagram, we can sum moments around point B. When we do that, we eliminate RBY and RBX, and all we're left with is FRAM and F contact. Okay, so let's do that. Let's say. Um, I guess we'll start with F RAM. Okay, um, the horizontal component of F RAM does not create a moment around B because its line of action passes right through B. That'd be that would be this component of that force. Only the vertical component, which kind of goes down to there, that's the only um, component that creates a moment around point B. So we'll take just that component, F RAM. Uh, times, I want the vertical component, I want uh, 76.8 over the square root, 76.8 squared plus 25.8 squared. And that picks off just the vertical component. What I do with that is multiply it by 21 inches to get a moment. And then I need to think about the direction to make sure that's correct. It does look like it creates a counterclockwise tendency to rotate, so positive is correct there. Okay. Now I need to look at my contact force, F contact. Okay. 
and it is going to also create a counterclockwise tendency to rotate. So I will add F contact multiplied by its length from its line of action to point D. Uh, and that would be 42 inches. Okay, so so far that's taken care of those two. The last one that I need to work on is the 670 pound force. So it would tend to create a counterclockwise tendency to rotate as well. So I would add 670 pounds multiplied by 82.8 inches. That takes care of all of my forces that would create moments around point B. Next here we have a sum of moments around point D for this second free body diagram. Okay. Um, again, the F ram, that force, has components, one of which goes up like this and one of which goes over like this. The horizontal component has a line of action that passes right through D, so it will not create moments about D. But the vertical component uh, does create moments about D, so we need to consider that. Okay, so I go in here, um, that F ram, the vertical component, tends to try to rotate this thing clockwise, so I say minus F ram. Okay, again, I just want the vertical component, so this is going to be the same as before, 76.8 over the square root of. 76.8 squared plus 25.8 squared. Okay. Now I do need to multiply this uh, force by the length from that line of action to point D, which is 46.8 inches. Okay. Now I need to take care of my F contact force, which tends to rotate this counterclockwise. Counterclockwise is positive, how I'm summing these up. So I say plus F contact times the line of action uh, of F contact is 25 inches away from point D. So I put 25 inches there. That takes care of those two forces, and now I need to figure out the effect of the 450 pound force. It'll tend to be a clockwise influence around D. Okay, so that would be, uh, excuse me, not clockwise, counterclockwise. That would be a positive 450 pounds times 70.8 inches counterclockwise around D. And what you see that we have here is a system of equations where we have two unknowns in each of them. Okay, And they are the same two unknowns. So this system of equations can be solved uh, readily using um, the solver in a calculator like this one. Okay, so for this calculator, you go into the equation mode. We're going to do a two by two, which is option one. And we're going to put in these coefficients. So the first one here, we have 76.8 times 21 uh, divided by the square root of 76.8 squared plus 25.8 squared. Okay, I believe that takes care of all of those pieces for that entry, for that coefficient. Okay, the next one is just 42. Okay, now for this last one, remember that this calculator needs that constant term to actually be on the other side of the equal sign. And if I was to move this term over to the other side of the equal sign, it would negate it. And so I'm going to put in a negative 670 times 82.8. Okay. Now we're going to go down to this next equation and we'll put in a negative 76.8 times 46.8 divided by 
the square root of 76.8 squared plus 25.8 squared. And I think that takes care of that whole term. The next term is just going to have 25 inches. So 25. Okay. And then lastly, remember the just like the last time, this uh, constant term needs to be on the other side of the expression. So we negate it from what we have. Uh, 450 times 70.8. And when I've got all those entered, I can hit equals. And it gives me here that my first uh, value is negative 20.66. Okay, that would be F RAM. All right, so F RAM negative 20.66 pounds. What does the negative mean? Well, the negative means that up here where we had assumed uh, tension in that member, that assumption was actually incorrect and it is time for us to, to interpret that. So the negative sign means that was incorrect. It means that the ram carries a compressive force and that compressive force is going to be 20.66 uh, pounds. Because we assume tension, came up with a negative answer, and that tells us it must have been uh, in compression. Okay, and that actually solves the, the problem that was asked. If we're curious, we go ahead and hit equals again, and that'll tell us our contact force. Okay. And that ends up being a negative uh, 1311.1, we'll say. And that's also in pounds. And what does that negative sign mean? Well, it means where we thought that the force acted to the right on the upper body and to the left on the lower body. That's reversed from what it really is. It really acts to the left on the upper body and to the right on the lower body. But just given the signs of the answer, um, it's clear enough what the conclusion is. So I hope this has been helpful. And uh, if it has, then I would appreciate it if you would subscribe to my channel. And uh, I'll see you on the next video.